Hello! I decided I would make a little video that's sort of a response to an older video of Jonathan Pajot's called There Is No Literal Meaning. He'll probably never watch this and my production values are pretty low, but here we go anyway. First off, I would like to say that in his video, Jonathan Pajot makes actually I think some really important points that I entirely approve of. So that's why this is a response. Um, it's a video sort of inspired of his challenging one thing about the video, um, which is perhaps a very important thing. But I think he's really, really good at reminding us to look at the symbolic and his idea of the symbol, which is a meeting point between sort of heaven and earth, sort of if we're thinking in Christian Platonic terms of things, that, that which is above to which we are ascending, sort of like um, in Dionysius, the Areopagite. So that's really important, and how symbol is a point of access, perhaps you could say, to the divine, which actually um, can also take us on to Coleridge and other exciting places, um, besides, of course, the fathers, who are the most exciting of all, for people like Jonathan Peugeot and myself. So what's my real problem with the video? My only problem is the fact that he fails, fails to address the concept of the literal at all. He rejects the idea that scripture gives us access to scientifically viable and accurate depictions of historical events. And so there is no literal meaning. There is no perfectly um, accessible, unmediated reality of those events, those narratives that are given to us in scripture. And since we don't actually have access to those events, that it's not a sort of detailed, super scientific blow by blow account of something, all we really have is the text and the text operates as a symbolic gateway to the divine. But what I think Pajot is actually targeting isn't really the literal meaning of scripture, as perhaps I might understand it, but a reductionist use of the literal in modern critical scholarship on the one hand, and Protestant doctrines of biblical inerrancy on the other. And there is a sense in which both, in fact, are completely irrelevant to how Jonathan Pajot reads the Bible. And I have no doubt that given that he would have been an evangelical teenager in the 90s, like myself, he, boy, all that time we spent trying to prove to atheists that the Bible is true, that Genesis 1 is a perfect scientific, compa scientifically compatible thing, and that good math and science and probability prove that the earth is 6,000 years old. Golly, no one wants to do a literal reading of the Bible after too much of that. Um... <sighs> Especially sometimes I think about some of the videos that we watched back then. One in particular where there's this tangent about the book of Job where he doesn't even get the literal sense of Job as I'm um, going to discuss it correct. Where he says that Job um, was targeted, was allowed to be targeted by Satan, that God allowed this to happen because Job had pride. And yet that is in fact completely contradictory to the literal meaning of the text, whether or not Job ever lived, and whether or not Behemoth and Leviathan are dinosaurs, which are which is debatable. Although personally, because I like cryptozoology, because I'm eccentric, I like the idea of them being dinosaurs, but who cares in terms of the doctrines of the church? And so, and when you think about that, you can see how perhaps arguing too much about the literal meaning of certain passages as to whether these are historically accurate depictions of real events especially Genesis 1 to 3 or Genesis 1 to 10 or 11, Jonah, Job, some of these other books, that possibly, even if it's an interesting conversation, is missing the point. And I'll get to that in a moment. But what about other things? What about the Gospels? What about the resurrection? It strikes me that here we can't just say, oh, there is no literal meaning in terms of the way contemporary society might mean. Do you take the Bible literally? Um, someone once said to a friend of mine at a party, by discovering, learning that my friend was doing a PhD in theology, this guy said to him, so what, do you really believe all that stuff like that Jesus walked on water? To which my friend said, well, if I believe that he rose from the dead, it's not that big a deal to believe that he also walked on water. But then again, that same friend of mine doesn't believe in the talking snake in the Garden of Eden. So... And Pajot has a big affinity for St. Maximus the Confessor, 7th century theologian, who got his tongue cut out 
by the emperor um, for continuing to teach that there exist in the person of Christ two wills. He's a diophilite for those who like big words descended from Greek. And so he talks about, um, in this video, uh, Jonathan Pajot talks about Maximus and the two senses of scripture that Maximus perceives. And so let's, how about I read you a little bit of Maximus the Confessor, Mystagogia, 6th Mystagogy, chapter 6. Maximus says, The sacred scripture, taken as a whole, is like a human being. The Old Testament is the body, and the new is the soul. The meaning it contains, the spirit. So there's a threefold thing going on here. From another viewpoint, we can say that the entire sacred scripture, Old and New Testament, has two aspects. The historical content, which corresponds to the body, and the deep meaning, the goal at which the mind should aim, which corresponds to the soul. If we think of human beings, we see that they are mortal in their visible properties, but immortal in their invisible qual qualities. So with scripture, it contains the letter, the visible text, which is transitory. But it also contains the spirit hidden beneath the letter, and this is never extinguished. And this ought to be the object of our contemplation. And so here we see Saint Maximus the Confessor, and he acknowledges that there is a historical sense. So would Origen, who is sort of the origin, if you will, of these ideas back in the third century. So St. Maximus says that we have a historical content that's like the body, and then the deep meaning, the spiritual sense, as we might call it, that corresponds to the soul. And if you read any of the fathers, the soul is the more important aspect of us. It is the thing that most closely mirrors the image of God in the human person. And so then, the letter, the actual physical text of scripture, we could even say, right? It is written down on parchment, papyrus, and eventually it is friable, fragmentary. It is lost, can be lost. But beneath the letter, and this is where we get to the allegorical, the symbolic, and the metaphorical, that are gateways. We have the spirit, and these the metaphor and allegory are gateways into a spiritual world, into the tropological I believe, as the word Maximus would use, well, tropos. Um, typology is another big thing um, for some of the fathers, such as St. Ephraim, the Syrian, who I love immensely. So, um, and St. Maximus's mystagogy has a lot of beautiful passages about scripture. And how basically, scripture is a means for us to access God. Another image that Maximus has um, elsewhere is on the Mount of Transfiguration, on Mount Tabor, when Christ is, as you remember the story, he is completely um, transformed and his clothes are shining as white and he is brilliant and the apostles can uh, barely behold him and you can look and in some icons of this, there are different stages of spiritual life that are portrayed there as um, they fall down shocked and amazed. And according to Saint Maximus, Christ's shining white garments are the literal sense of scripture. Whereas Christ himself is the spiritual sense. So once again, that which you can see up front covers over something underneath that you have to seek um, and seek for prayerfully. Find Christ himself um, in the scriptures. And this symbolic approach is how Jonathan Pajot seeks to read the Bible. And almost all Orthodox followers, it's small-o Orthodox, um, non-heretical ancient Christians, if you will, read the Bible this way. Gregory of Nyssa, who is Jonathan Pajot's other favorite father, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, um, or St. Gregory the Theologian in the Eastern tradition, St. Ambrose of Milan, St. Augustine of Hippo, Dionysius the Areopagite, and on the list goes. And let me tell you, this kind of reading of the scriptures can be very liberating. So let's go back briefly to the 90s and the creation versus evolution debate. Maybe it still is ongoing in some circles. I don't know. It's been over 20 years. When I, in the early 2000s, finally read St. Augustine's Confessions as a young man, I, Confessions 13 is a reading of Genesis 1, and it reads it, though, 
in terms of the spiritual sense. It doesn't read it according to the letter, but according to the spirit, according to what that which in St. Maximus's vision lies underneath that which is the real goal, the whole purpose of reading scripture. The whole purpose of reading scripture is not to gather historical data. The whole purpose of reading scripture is to use it as a gateway to encounter the one true and living God. And so another thing that Augustine does, and so I found this liberating, to encounter um, the spiritual sense of scripture. And then Augustine also says, which is mind-blowing, which I'm sure some would consider a gateway into liberalism or something like that, that there can be multiple options when you interpret a passage of scripture as pregnant with meaning as Genesis 1. But so long as these all uphold the rule of caritas, the rule of love, it doesn't really matter as long as they are all in accord with the Catholic faith, with the rule of faith, which we would call today the creed. And so somehow that was sort of this burst open this gateway to me. And I realized that perhaps creation and evolution was a distraction and the real thing was simply, in this particular case, I'm not saying this for all of scripture, but in this particular moment, what really mattered wasn't, is it a literal six day creation 6,000 years ago? What matters is the creation of the universe by God, creatio ex nihilo, the creation of the human soul, the human spirit, the ways in which we ourselves are, an, are in fact, could be allegorically represented by the days of creation, which is an idea found in St. Ambrose of Milan and before him, um, St. Basil the Great, Bishop of Cappadocia, other 4th century fathers um, who are using this spiritual way of reading scripture. And there seems to be something bigger going on that has little to do with dinosaur fossils um, or Australopithecines, quite frankly. Because the purpose of the spiritual sense, which is the full purpose of the entirety of scripture, is to get to God. Scripture as a real presence, to borrow the title, from a book by Hans Borsma, Scripture as Real Presence, that there is something sacramental going on. When we read the Bible, we are actually gaining access to the God Word himself, the Word and wisdom of God, Jesus Christ, has inspired Scripture, and Scripture ushers us into God. And the symbolic mode, espoused by people like Jonathan Pajot, or on the Protestant side, people like um, James Jordan, Alistair Roberts, now Hans Borsma, um, is beautiful way of reading scripture and I think can be much more fruitful in our lives um, than sitting down and going through biblical archaeology magazine and trying to find out if they have evidence for the fall of the troops of Sennacherib when they besieged Jerusalem back in the days of Isaiah the prophet in the 700s BC. So is there no literal meaning then if the symbolic meaning is so important? Well, I would like to give us a gateway into the literal meaning that could make us through the impasse that maybe, maybe there is a literal meaning in scripture. And to do this, I would like to pull out St. Augustine. Here he is. And his book, De Doctrina Christiana on Christian Teaching. And in De Doctrina, St. Augustine does not invent semiotics, but people like to say that he does. And he discusses how there are signs, there are signa, and there are things, there are res. Scripture itself is a signum, if you think about it, right? In all of language, that's what the signa are. And I realized I hadn't said that yet. So in all of language, signa basically are the words. They're the signs that point to other realities. So the basic signum of language is the spoken word, and then you can have, which comes into being and then dies. It exists only so long as I am speaking. My words die. Although now they exist on the internet in a whole way that I don't think Augustine could imagine. But even then you listen to them and then they pass away. You have to go back and all of that. So to represent words more fully, you come with a, another sign that is the sign of the race that is the sign that is the spoken word and that is the written word. So scripture itself is a series of signs. And what they signify, the race, is whatever comes in your mind when you read them. And this includes, of course, the historical narratives. But the, the ultimate, the final rays, the final thing towards which sacred scripture, towards which all of the signa of scripture point, is God himself. 
But of course, God isn't a thing. Augustine knows it, and he gets into some beautiful passages about um, the incomprehensibility of God and the incapacity of human language to grapple with the ultimate being who God is. Uh, he gets into that here in De Doctrina, as well as some beautiful passages in Confessions. And then the question of God as a being, Ascentia, is part of um, De Trinitate, his treatise on the Trinity, as well as elsewhere throughout his books. He deals with these things as a trained rhetor, as a trained orator of the Roman world. But anyway, the race... At one level, then, if we think about this way of looking at the universe, looking at signs and language, the race to which the signa of Scripture, the language of Scripture point, are the historical events, the stuff that is being told in Exodus, the stuff that's being told in Genesis. Joshua judges Esther. <coughs> so what does it mean for there to be a literal sense, to be reading the Scriptures ad literam, as far as these books are concerned, is just that there are historical narratives, and so there is a literal sense. Now, are these historically factually true? I think that's not an unreasonable question to ask, and I actually think it can be a fun question to ask. But I do, th you know, I mean, Gregory of Nyssa, in his Life of Moses, spends the first half of the book giving us the historical sense. And the fathers will say that the historical sense itself is useful for teaching us all sorts of things. There are lots of lessons that God gives us in the letter of Scripture. Um, so we cannot discount that literal sense. And we, I don't see why there is a problem of saying that it actually did happen. Um, but we'll get to an event where I think the union of both at the, sing, at the same time, I think is a beautiful thing. So, so that's what the uh, literal sense is as far as those are concerned. But it is also the case that some of the, the fathers, Augustine included, not to mention Origen, who people like to flagellate even though they haven't read him and don't have a clue what he actually says, deny the actual historicity of some parts of scripture, and yet are still able to draw forth from those things that they don't think are actually true, we might say, draw forth both a literal meaning in terms of what the signs, the basic sense means, as well as a deeper spiritual meaning. And so, but let's look at, I think, a thing that matters. A thing that I think really matters. Maybe it doesn't matter that much if all the battles in Joshua actually happened as Scripture narrates. I think Augustine would disagree, but we'll leave that aside. You know what actually matters? The actual incarnation of the God Word. That is also, that, that's basically it. Um, and by that, I don't just mean the incarnation of the God Word in terms he was born as a baby in Bethlehem. I mean his life, teaching, death, resurrection, and ascension. If these things did not historically happen then none of the symbolic sense of scripture is worth the paper it's printed on today or the papyrus it was written on in the first century AD. So, since it's ascension tide in the Western church, let's think about literal and symbolic and the ascension of the Lord. The ascension of Christ into heaven is a historical fact. I think it's literally true. It actually happened. Um... And so the ad literam, the literal meaning of the words of scripture in Acts 1, 4 to 11 is as follows. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So what is the literal meaning of the Acts 1 story here? Literally speaking, Jesus meets with the apostles, gives them his final teaching, he says farewell, 
He ascends up into the sky, a cloud appears, and they never see him again. That's it. He has gone to be with the Father as he had promised and, for and prophesied. So if we use scripture to interpret scripture, that's what happened when the cloud removed him from their sight. That's the literal meaning. That's the historical meaning. It actually, loads of Protestant sermons have been preached on it in that way, and it's great. However, there's a symbolic meaning. And I think when we start thinking about it symbolically, this is something that actually Pajot has helped me go back into some of the fathers I read uh, over a decade ago, like Gregory of Nyssa's Life of Moses, um, and think about these things. And so when I think about the ascension and symbolism and scripture, I think about the ascent of mountains in the Old Testament. Consider that Moses on Mount Horeb encounters the burning bush. And according to tradition, that is the same mountain as is Mount Sinai, where he was he received the law, and where there's that amazing passage um, whose allegorical spiritual meaning is rich with metaphor and um, can, of about what this Christian spiritual life is like. Um, Mount Zion is where the temple was. Elijah on Mount Carmel is where God basically just owns the priests of Baal. And then you have Elijah in the still small voice, an encounter with God that also occurs on top of a mountain. And so these are some Old Testament precedents. Um, and then we also have the Mount of Transfiguration, which um, once again, Christ goes up onto the top of a mountain where in, and then his garments are transfigured. And that um, we can see also is sort of a parallel for Mount, parallel for Mount Sinai um, and a theophany that Moses had there. And this is a theophany for the apostles of Christ. And then on the Sermon on the Mount, many of the fathers say that the Sermon on the Mount is like Mount Sinai again, in that on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the law. And um, in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ gives us the new law. He gives us um, all these things like the Beatitudes and how to pray and all these sorts of things come to us from Christ on the Mount as they came from God to Moses on the Mount. And so these ascents are places of meeting with God. So it seems fairly natural that the symbolic meaning of the text of the ascension is that Jesus is going to God. We don't need to ask, was there some other historical event that was interpreted by their feeble, our, the feeble minds of them, which are as feeble as ours, of the disciples, but rather simply that this symbolic and literal are the actual same thing. That Christ literally ascended to heaven because ascending a mountain is an image for going to God. So he literally ascended into the sky. Um, and then like on Mount Sinai, he ascends into a cloud. He doesn't just go up into the sky. A cloud envelops him, which reminds us of the incomprehensibility of God. Um, reminds us of Moses going into the cloud. Um, right? When God, um, to the tribes on Sinai's height, um, in ancient times, it's give the law and cloud and majesty and awe. And so Christ himself enveloped in the cloud, which is itself not just symbolic of the encounter and crossing over to being with God, but also of the incomprehensibility of God um, when we try to um, look upon him. And so this, in my mind, is, a, I think, an important symbolic reading of the Ascension, which is itself firmly united to the literal reading and draws on the symbols of the Old and New Testaments leading up to this moment, which is an important part of the gospel as preached by the apostles in the book of Acts. And it makes sense that this would happen it makes sense that God in his providence would not simply make the text of scripture rich in symbol, but would make the events that that text at some level represents events which are ultimately inaccessible to us. I'm not going to deny that. Um, events that are inaccessible to us in the same way that Caesar's Gallic Wars are inaccessible to us. Um, but unlike Caesar's Gallic Wars, they do enable us to enter into the provid the presence of God. And so through his providence, God made those events transpire in such a way and inspired the writers to write about them and choose which events to write about in such a way that these symbols are embedded in both the fabric of human history and the fabric of scripture, let alone in the literature that we as human beings write. Christianity is the myth that comes true. So maybe there is a historical meaning. We may have no direct access to the rays, those events of Acts 1. We only have access to the signa, the signs, the words, the language, 
that tell us about them. And the rays, the things that those signa, those signs represent, are representations of historical events. But as the word of God, the signa that are the words of Acts 1, open up the divine to us, and they escort us into the presence of Christ. The words are the body that represents to us the soul of Scripture, and that is the spiritual meaning. So, I'm Matthew Hoskin. This is just my first YouTube video in about 10 months. Hopefully there will be more to come, and I hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day.